After more than 14 years living abroad, anywhere in the world, doesn't matter where you're from or where you're going, I think anybody would have a hard time not having some opinions and perceptions that may have changed over the years since they left their home country. So that's what we're going to talk about this week on Not Your Average Globetrotter. I'm Rafael Di Furia. Let's just jump into it and roll that intro. Growing up in the US, there are many ideas and many concepts and perceptions of the world that end up being shared by many people, whether they agree politically or not. And the aim of this video is not to get into politics so much, even though it may lightly touch on them from time to time. But the first thing that I always have a, I don't want to say laugh about, but I maybe have a little chuckle about is the term that is often thrown around in the US, the leader of the free world, or how the US is the kind of the, the top nation setting the standard for the rest of the world, pushing the way into future for liberty and freedom for all. And I don't know if I've actually met all that many people who have even heard that type of terminology before, leader of the free world for, for example, the US president, doesn't matter which one, whoever happens to be in office at the time. This is a concept that most people I've ever kind of had a discussion roughly around this area have never even heard of before. And the few that have heard of it thought it was like a joke that everybody was in on. It was just a really interesting perception of something that is seen as a truth in a certain part of the world, very specifically. And so whenever I'm watching news or commentators from the US talking about American topics and this term is brought up, I always happen to have like a little chuckle. It's like, oh yeah, that's, that's what people talk about in the States. That's one of those things that's over there. It's part of the perception that many people share, whether it's true or not. And this actually gets into a little bit of what I might call one of the reasons why some people think of this as a joke. And that is also, I have to kind of preface a lot of this video, even though we're already into it, that there are ideas in this episode that are going to seem critical of the country that I'm from, but I will say that I do have love for the, for the USA. I am very much grateful for the opportunities that I had growing up in the States. There are certain things that I can look back on and see, okay, maybe there would have been room for improvement. So it's not meaning to say, oh, it's this kind of country or that kind of country, or it's, it's good, it's bad, it's this, it's that. No, 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 no. This is looking at it from a perspective that like, hey, there's room for improvement or that there are things that are done differently in a part of the world. But one of the reasons why some people see the whole free leader of the free world as a little bit of a joke is because the perception of American education is that it's not the best. And having been through a lot of my schooling in the US, I can't say that my experience was necessarily a positive experience. And it's definitely something that I would not want my children, if I had them, to go through because I think there's a lot of issues that unfortunately arise and many parts of the system focus on test taking. And that's not necessarily education, it's just information stuffing. Is it good to know information in this world? Absolutely. But to really learn about life and to learn how to actually move through life, the skills, I can't even say that I necessarily learned so many skills while in school now that I even think about it just off the top of my head. I'm like, as I'm talking here, I'm examining my own thoughts and I'm like, what were the actual skills that I picked up? And the majority of the important skills in my life that I can say I did not pick up through school, I picked up either on my own, studying on my own, learning on my own, because I enjoyed that. And I still always am educating myself on different topics or learning about different things, whether it's in my field or a different field or just a hobby that I have. I'm always taking time to, throughout my day, learn. And very few of the teachers that I personally had in the US, I would actually say were individuals who really could do a proper job at teaching students, at teaching the next generation, getting them ready for the real world. I mean, out of all the years that I did, maybe really one or two at best. Of course, this is not to say that this is everybody's experience, but this was definitely mine. And I lived in different parts of the States. I lived in different school districts. Having experienced different parts of the school system in different parts of the country, I can say that there were similarities across the board. But of course, when we're talking even about like the test taking and having to stuff information to be able to just regurgitate onto the next test, that isn't limited to the US. So I'm not saying, oh, if you move to Italy or if you move to Portugal or if you move here or if you move there, that it's not going to be the same because there will be aspects that can be. So I would say it's not necessarily a problem just with the US and that it's a problem across the board, but within the borders of the US, it 
unfortunately seems to me to be a very common issue. Even the stress that was put onto students during state testing times, that was horrible. I mean, kids were really going through anxiety and panic attacks, young kids that they shouldn't have been having to deal with. So, I mean, hey, like, I'm not going to say that I'm any kind of education expert or childhood expert or uh, child rearing expert, but I can say, again, my experience and the experience of many of my peers at the time was not necessarily positive. Another thing, though, that I often do see in the States and that friends tell me about, like, what their experiences and what they're going through over there is access to health care and what they're having to go through on a day-to-day -day basis. I've mentioned it many times and Not Your Average Globetrotter about how there are people who approach going to an emergency room in a very different way than people back in the States might. I mean, I know plenty of people that it's like, you don't go to the emergency room unless like it's a life and death situation and that it's like a serious emergency. But I've known people in other countries that are, oh, have a little belly ache. So it's time to go to the emergency room to make sure that their tummy feels OK. And one of the reasons why they're able to do that is because in some parts of the world, the healthcare system is I'm not going to say that it's affordable, but you will always have access to it. But the reason why I say specifically that it's not necessarily affordable, okay, it's affordable at the time of the emergency itself that you will be provided for. But the thing is, you will have higher social contributions that you have to pay. Taxes pay for healthcare as well. So a lot of people will say, oh my gosh, healthcare in this part of the world or that part of the world is free. And it's free or low cost at the time of actually being billed, but you are paying through various other ways for the system to actually be functional. And that definition of functional will vary greatly depending on where you are, because even when you're talking about the rankings of healthcare around the world, one country may be higher than another country, one country may be lower than another country, and the US isn't always necessarily ranked at the highest levels. However, one point that I do have to say in favor of things in the US is that if you are able to afford the healthcare, that the healthcare that you will receive will be, generally speaking, at a pretty decent level, like more than just decent. So the healthcare itself is one thing. The access to healthcare is a completely different story. And so there may be parts of the world where you will have access to healthcare, but it might be more of a question, not if you'll be seen, but when you'll be seen. Like if you need, a, for example, uh, physical therapy and you need it on the public system, will you be able to get it immediately when you're needing it? Or will you have to wait a few months for it? And the same for surgeries and so on. This is unfortunately not uncommon when you are dealing with some of these systems. If it's like a really grave, serious emergency, then yes, these services will often, depending on the country, be carried out very quickly, but it's not guaranteed everywhere. And so even though I will say that the US is not the best when it comes to access to healthcare, the healthcare itself, that's something. But it also gets into another point. Just before I get into the next point, though, I do want to say a huge thank you to those of you who support this project and help keep it going through Patreon on a monthly basis or the one-time donations through the thanks button here on YouTube. But let's jump into that next point now. Many individuals in the States have a perception about the world outside of the U.S. borders and North America, really more so U.S. and Canada. I say that for a very specific reason, but many people I've had interactions with over the years have said, well, what is it? Is it safe in these places or what's life like? I mean, it's, it's not the same because America is such a wonderful place and it's just you'll never find the same quality of life. People don't live like how we live. It's one of the best countries in the world. How could you ever leave this wonderful place? And I would say it's very easy to do that because even though in many regards there are things that I would say were at the top of the list, aren't necessarily still that way, even when it comes to quality of life. What are you talking about specifically about quality of life? Are you talking about that you're going to earn X amount per year? Yeah. But then what is your cost of living going to be? Is it going to be a significant portion of that? Then, well, how well are you really living if you're just working to make sure that you have enough to pay at the end of the month? That's one of the reasons why people do the whole digital nomad thing or decide to move to another part of the world and work remotely so that they can lower their cost of living and 
not have some of those same concerns that come up from a financial standpoint. But there's been plenty of times where I've met people who think that people in some parts of the world live in huts. I mean, even like I have family that's from Brazil. I was, I don't remember, I was a teenager at the time. We were visiting my family. We we're going to go see my grandmother. And, and I don't remember if it was a friend of mine specifically or a family friend from the States, but it's like, oh, but your grandmother's, does she live in a hut? What does she live in? Is What is it even like? Is it in the middle of the jungle? It's like, yes, my grandmother lives in a seven story hut with an elevator in the middle of a city. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like people have a certain idea of other parts of the world. Okay, granted, when we're talking about Brazil, there's definitely security concerns that may come up in certain parts of the country, and if not a lot of the country, being quite realistic. But I will say at the same time, when we're talking about the ideas of poverty and security, the U.S. has plenty of issues in that regard as well. And it feels as though, at least in the past few years, it's only really just multiplied how big those issues are becoming not even just becoming how big those issues already are so when i hear people asking oh but is it do you have to worry about this or that or the other it's like well would you have that same concern in san francisco chicago new york miami like you have to kind of put things into perspective and if you would have those same concerns in a city in your own country, that's one thing. If you wouldn't have those same concerns in a city in your own country, then that's another thing. Maybe where you have to look at how your perception of the reality around you. But even when we're talking about, oh my gosh, the U.S. being like the most wonderful, amazing place. One thing for me that it really lacks is a variety in culture and what you have access to. And just to quickly jump into the middle of this episode here, as I'm editing it, I'm realizing that what I just said here may sound a little bit off and a little bit odd. Because yes, in the States, you do have cultural diversity. You have different peoples from different places representing different cultures, different foods, different languages. However, what I'm talking about more is that once you get outside of the major metropolitan areas, outside of the big cities, that you don't have the same representation of culture there. When you're going from one place to another in some parts of the world, like again, I'll use Europe as an example, that you will be able to drive and you'll be already in a different place and a different people in a different culture. Whereas in the States, it's more so, in my opinion, that you'll hit a pocket of a group of people. Like, for example, you could say a Chinatown, a Korea, a little Korea, uh, a little Italy, but especially when we're talking about something like Little Italy, it's going to be a tiny pocket that is representative of an immigrant population a couple generations down the line, very separated culturally from what the or country of origin was actually like. So yeah, is there an influence there? Sure, but you're not actually going for the full experience of what it is like to travel to a completely different place with a completely different language and a completely different culture. Anyway, let's just jump back into it. I mean, even for example, when I lived in Italy, one place that I lived in particular uh, up in Alto Adige, the first area that I was making videos from, if I had jumped into a car and driven for an hour, I could have driven through three different cultural groups with three different languages, three different types of cuisine, and three different languages, three different everything, three different ways of being. But in the States, you drive, forget an hour, you drive three days. And sometimes, especially if you're driving like, I don't know, say in the I-5 or one of the big highways, that sometimes the towns, the small towns along the way just feel like copied and pasted that you have like, your fast food stores, then a liquor store, then a gun store, then another liquor store, another couple fast food place, some big chain supermarket. Uh, uh, and like, it's just those uh, gas station, like the same 7-Eleven, whatever it may be. You'll see the same stores in different places, almost in the same type of configuration. And there's not necessarily so much unique. Let's just use like an example from say, driving from Redding, California to Wenatchee in Washington. When you're driving up the I-5 and across the states and through the, the smaller highways and so on, you're not necessarily going to see so many places that are culturally unique, that offer something unique as far as the cuisine goes. You're seeing, again, a lot of that same copy and paste small town life and the, even the, the quote unquote McMansions, if you start getting into some of the towns, that it's literally you can drive down 
one road and see a, a, a little development where the homes literally are copied and pasted, that it's just they, they have the same, what, five to 10 basic plans for homes, and they just put them in a certain order that kind of is in a semi-repeating pattern. Oh, my house is the same as your house down the block. Oh, that's so cool. Oh, so you know when you walk into the house and you go to the left and you have the, the garage there and the this and the that, like you can describe the floor plan in minor detail and the person knows exactly what you're talking about because their home is the exact same. So that's one thing that I really do appreciate about other parts of the world where you have, I mean, here also in Braga where I live, if I go like less than an hour north, even way less than that but to, to get to the border, but to get to like, say the next city up in Spain, we're talking about a different language, different culture. Yes, it's similar in some ways, to what you find in Portuguese culture, and even the language has some commonalities, but it's not the same language at all. And there are many differences between the people here and the people over the border. And if you go to different countries, I mean, even this area that I was talking about where I lived up in Alto Adige, say you drive a few more hours, not just that singular hour with three languages, three cultures, three cuisines, three different peoples. If you drive a couple more hours, a few more hours beyond that, then you're already adding in X amount of more languages, countries, and cultures. Remember, when I'm talking about those three within the space of an hour, I'm talking about not multiple countries. I'm talking about the same region in one country. And so that's another aspect, I guess you could say, about quality of life. What are you wanting to experience? And if you have to travel so far to experience something so different, but really maybe there's not all that much that's so different at the end of the day, Okay, maybe instead of a, a Safeway, you're going to end up at an Albertsons. Oh, wow, that's, oh, ooh. <laughs> this is a, this is something special. But this also gets into another factor that I also see about a difference in the lifestyle as well between how things are in the U.S. versus how they are in many parts of the world. And that comes down to something that may sound silly, but zoning. Zoning in different parts of the world works differently. And in the States, when you have your house it's often in a residential neighborhood and there's not going to be really much else or if anything else other than specifically just homes where people live in. And if you want to go out to another area, then you have to drive there. And so your ability to get around, walkability, it, it, many towns are set up like little highways that have these like little dots that you kind of just get off of the, one of the main big four-way, eight-lane street, whatever it may be. and you don't have the, the ability to get to really interact with the place where you live. And that's something that I really enjoy is having the space around me, the neighborhood around me, the community around where I live. I feel as though maybe in the States, because if you want to work someplace, you have to drive who knows how long to get across town or to another city, whatever it may be. Not that people don't do that here or in other parts of the world. What I'm saying is that very often, you will have residential, commercial, restaurants, cafes, stores, whatever, anything. Well, I will say, though, that there is a benefit to having extreme zoning in some ways that you won't have a factory that's built right smack dab in the middle of a residential area. There's something to be said for that, for sure. But generally speaking, it's nice when you are able to walk from your home to a store or to go with, meet with friends or to be walking through town and you see people that you know because you're all living within the same area. You're all calling this area home and that's when I think community really starts building up because you can have community in the sense of, oh yeah, we all live here, happy, happy, whatever. But community is also people interacting with each other, people helping each other, people supporting each other's businesses, supporting each other in other ways as well. And that's something that because of car culture in the States, I think is almost lost at times. It's great to have freedom to be able to drive wherever you want, when you want, how you want. But at the same time, I think there are some parts of that culture that end up separating people at times. I'm not saying, oh, people shouldn't drive or people shouldn't this. But what I'm saying is that the way that it ends up contributing to the lifestyle ends up developing a whole detached system that works in a very different way. So again, when people are saying, 
oh my gosh, America has the best lifestyle and the most wonderful things and the this and the da da We're often talking about disconnected aspects of life that focus on materialistic goals. I'm not saying having materialistic goals is bad, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying that there's a problem with being able to own something and being able to call it yours. What I'm saying is that there are times when the material items in our lives can sometimes be put on such a priority level that it ends up taking away from other things. But more so from a geographical perspective that ends up influencing culture and perspectives of the, the rest of the world is that North America is very isolated in comparison to other places. Like in Europe, like I said, you drive less than an hour, you drive minutes, you have a different language, different culture, different people. And what you end up learning about other places, it's more like, okay, that place with those people over there doing that thing, and they speak the funny language, and they, they wear the different clothes, are they this or they that? But how much is actually understood about different parts of the world, about even basic geopolitical things, like this group and that group historically have had an issue because of X topic in Y time with Z origin and this and that and the other, and that has led to X and Y group having tensions between them today. I mean, even, I'm not talking about anywhere specific, but this even does exist within Europe, that there's certain groups that have certain feelings about each other based on historical context that sometimes we're not even taught in the U.S. because it's just from that place over there that we may never have real interaction with unless it's on an international level, whereas in other parts of the world, what's happening on the other side of the border is not that far away and can have repercussions that end up uh, making their way to your front doorstep. So even from a linguistic level, the amount of languages that the average American will end up speaking will be just their native language, like English, we'll say. Or if you have another language other than English, but we're talking about the quote-unquote average American being raised in an English-speaking environment, very often will not have much exposure to other languages, and they just simply won't need them. And I'm not saying it's a good thing or it's a bad thing, and it's not unique to the U.S. also, because there are plenty of other places in the world where there is just one language spoken by the nationality, and they don't really have much need for another language outside of their own. So I'm not saying that's necessarily a negative. However, there then are parts of the world where speaking two or three languages is like, ooh, you only speak two or three languages? I feel bad for you, my dude. <laughs> I mean, I know people like that. Like, because the, the places where they grew up, having exposure to different cultures and different languages was just a part of everyday life. And being able to communicate with those different people actually presented opportunities. And so even for me, English is my main language, but I do have the ability to get around in a few other languages that I'm grateful for. There's a practical reason why I've needed different languages in my life because I needed to work. I needed to be able to communicate with, uh, I don't know, a cab driver or to communicate with someone from the electrical company. Like there are practical reasons why in other parts of the world, having other languages can be very beneficial. And it's not like that, oh, that you're learning it for any type of status. It's just, again, there's that necessity that may come into your life, depending also on maybe how many countries you've lived in, or how many people from other countries are coming to your country because of whatever reason. And I will be the first person to argue that being able to get by with another language, or at least understand the logic of how other languages are put together, really does change how you think about things and changes how you approach life because each language has its own logic of how it will describe things or how it will form the sentence or how words will be formed that may not exist in the other. So it gets you thinking about different concepts in different ways and how to approach different problems in life in maybe a, a different and creative way that you might not have had. And again, this is really maybe speaking in a more abstract sense, but there is definitely a value to not just learning a language, but being able to use it. Like in high school in the States, many kids learn Spanish or French and sometimes German, but how often are you actually going to need that? Okay, in some parts of the States, having Spanish could be practical, but other foreign languages, French, 
German, Italian, Portuguese. How often are you really going to have exposure to those languages that would necessitate your actually being able to use them? But anyway, this is where I'm going to wrap up. So thank you for joining me for another episode of Not Your Average Globetrotter. I'm Rafael Di Furia. Stay safe and healthy out there. And I will see you all next time. Later. Thank you.